Welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook in association with Liftoff. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in user acquisition, monetization, and mobile game design. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is the podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. I'm your host, John Jordan, and uh, joining me today, we have uh, Yashir Kurareshi, who is a VP Head of Studios at Sansoft Games. How's it going, Yashir? Hello, hello. Very good to be here. Yeah, good to have you on the podcast. And uh, we also have uh, Timu uh, Palamaki, Chief Game Analyst at Game Refinery. How's it going, Timu? Going great. Great to be here. Good, good, good to have you back. Um, so in today's episode, we're going to talking sort of looking generally about sort of bringing new talent into the industry and specifically about some of the stuff that uh, Sandsoft Games is doing. But maybe, uh, yes, year to, to sort of start us off, maybe if you can give us a brief introduction about Sandsoft Games for people who haven't uh, heard of you yet, that would, might be a good starting point. And then we'll kick into, into press start your uh, initiative. Um, I've been in the industry for about 14, 15 years now, various roles at EA on FIFA and uh, Zynga at CSR and Dawn of Titans and Need for Speed back back in the day. So uh, I've had my fair share of experience across console and also um, mobile development. And um, Sansoft Games is really a, a, a sort of really interesting company. We started off probably about sort of three or so years ago in, in a sort of different guise. Uh, we're owned by a, a Saudi Arabian based company called Agilana Brothers, which is one of the most successful private run family businesses in the Middle East. Um, and they essentially wanted to capitalize on the new Vision, uh, Vision 2030. And that meant getting into gaming uh, for them. And as you've seen, there's been a massive investment in the region. You know, most recently you've seen and heard of a lot of acquisitions happening as well. But beyond that, the government has really invested here quite heavily to the tune of about $38 billion that have been committed to gaming just over the next three or four years. And so Sansoft's strategy as a part of that is kind of threefold. Firstly, it's to develop studios. So we have a studio that will be opening up in Europe, um, hopefully by around June time this year. We have a studio that we've just opened up here in Riyadh at the beginning of the year, and we're heavily recruiting for that. And then uh, we also publish games, and we've published several different games as well. We originally started off with a couple of licensed IP products with Rambo Strike Force and Pacific Rim. And now we've also moved on into publishing uh, international games as well. We recently uh, are publishing Do Dreams Drive Ahead as well for the Middle Eastern region too. That's got about 200 million downloads so far. And we're doing many other things as well that are going to be coming up in the year. And then the final pillar is that we also invest. So we invest in game studios and also into games as well. Most recently, we just invested into a game studio out in um, the south of France uh, called Tiny Digital Factory, which focuses a little bit more on NFTs and is known for a couple of racing games, one being GT Manager and then the other one being Infinite Drive, which is uh, launched this year as well. So we do a lot of things, but we're really into gaming uh, full stop. And the final distinction that I would make is that while we are headquartered within Saudi Arabia, we have international offices and we're a worldwide gaming company. We aren't making games for the Middle East region necessarily. We're focused on games for for everyone. Yeah, it was interesting you mentioned that. I think that was something that a few years ago was sort of became a, um, I guess, was the first stage of the sort of, you know, people were in that region were developing games for that audience. And that, I guess that sort of got them to a certain level of development. But now that seems to be have sort of been removed. And now all the companies in that region are now much more sort of internationally focused. And there's much less focus on sort of specific regional content because obviously that's a very small market. So anyway, you so say you guys are super busy. <laughs> so it sounds like, uh, Every, every you're doing everything really um so let, let's talk a little bit about um sort of press start i mean i guess this sort of comes from you know there have been game developers in in that in in that sort of region um but i guess the up to this point it's been sort of maybe slightly sort of ad hoc so sort of the entrepreneurs have started stuff up it doesn't seem like there's necessarily been a a, a, a sort of strong um sort of focus on that and i guess when you're trying to build big companies and i guess you're trying to build a big company there you just don't have Though you just don't have sort of senior people in the region because the industry has not been, you know, hasn't been around for that long in their eyes, I suppose, to, to build up a big company. So is that where Press Start comes from or is there is there something else going on there? Saudi Arabia, is, you know, while it has the ambition and it has definitely the resources to kind of build things at scale, um, you alluded to it as well. It doesn't quite have that established, developed talent base because this hasn't been an industry here um, at all. So it's in its very infant, nascent stages as well. So our kind of strategy for that was to essentially kind of try and understand how can we help develop the talent within the region 
but at the same time also knowing that we're a commercially minded company and we're looking to make games for 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 people all around the world how do we best achieve that and when we sat down and we kind of thought about this um you know one of the one of the key insights that that I kind of really formed the sort of program around when we were pitching it internally was that we didn't want to just have an intern program. We didn't want to have something where you could come and shadow somebody who we'd brought in from another part of the world who's got 10, 15 years experience and you can kind of see what they do. For us, it was about making games developers. And, you know, there's this, there's this adage that, you know, you, you learn from 20% of what you hear, uh, 30% of what you see, but 80% of what you experience. And so what we wanted to do was to push people into the deep end. Um, we always assess people on passion and potential. And we went through a heavy kind of recruitment process to kind of um, figure out how many people out there we felt we could bring in for this first program. And we recruited eight um, uh, people into the program, a mix of designers, artists, progr uh, and uh, programmers. And we essentially said to them, you have one mission, which is you have six months, you have all the resources that we can provide. You've got a lot of the experience from the team that already exist here at Samsoft, but your mission is to create one game at the end of that six months. And you know, learning by doing, learning by working within that small team environment, which is something that we pride ourselves on in terms of the culture of the studio that we have as well. That all was really important for us, for them to get to know how to make games in the style that we like. So working with small nimble teams and kind of scaling from there, but then also for them to learn about how to work in a professional games company, professional games environment, learn how to communicate, talk with each other and kind of share all these sorts of ideas as well. So it's really a baptism by fire, but definitely feel like it's the best way to learn as opposed to kind of, you know, necessarily just sitting on sort of training courses uh, uh, and so on as well. And the other thing I would add is that it was very important for us to assess people's passion by what they've already been doing. And it's amazing because, as you said, most people in this in this region, certainly in this country, haven't had the opportunity to work at a games company, yet that hasn't stopped them from working on games. And so everybody that we have on the program currently has already shipped a game themselves, whether it be on Steam, whether it be on mobile. And you know these are people who are studying or maybe have a job and are hobbyists or doing things with friends. So when you have that sort of appetite and that sort of energy where people are eliminating any chance of an excuse to say, hey, this is why we can't do it. Instead, they're focusing on the reasons they can. It makes you want to work with them even more and understand what sort of potential they could fulfill if they had the right resources around them. Yeah, I guess it's also very important that they, it's not just a sort of a, a program where people sort of like, you know, oh, sort of do some learning or something. They have to, have to create something. So there's like a focus on, you know, you've got this six month period, but at the end of it, we're all going to, everyone in the company is going to sit down and play your game <laughs> and it's gonna be pretty embarrassing if, <laughs> if that's not quite what you want it to be that's quite quite a good um, incentive isn't it uh, i mean timu obviously not you're not running a sort of similar program like that but, but you are involved in the sort of have been involved as a game developer doing this you know how do you, do you think the industry more generally is, is sort of good at bringing people on uh depends on location of course uh, for for me uh my my way of coming to the game industry was it was kind of uh, through just studying it, and so I, I, I was I, I was studying in in Kajani in Finland, and w the school there had had basically a similar kind of uh, system uh, uh, that you are actually making games, you are focusing on creating games and learning by experience, where the eighty percent of the learning comes, as as Yasir said. So um, I, I've experienced this kind of system uh, on. Kind of lower level, there wasn't like business aspect uh, related to it, but it it really works. And and creating this kind of opportunity for for people is really beneficial. And uh, you know, um, the fact that they have the resources, they they've had they had the passion to create something um, uh, on on their own time, but now having the resources to actually uh, create something and and get the uh, help uh, to things that they they might uh, have been lacking before. Uh, that's definitely a boost, and and it will uh, most most certainly help help the game development in 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 the region for sure. So I I wish these these kinds of uh, programs were more common. Like uh, I, I I've I've seen you know in Finland uh, Supercell was making the hive programming school that's a school aspect not like a training training for the company per se but they're 
is also the peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and the industry experts kind of giving uh, resources and help. And, and many Finnish companies are then uh, picking the best from there when, when they train to their specific needs. So, so this is definitely something that is, I, I think is really good for the industry. And I guess it's something that you know we've we've really seen you know, over over the years. There's, it can become easier, it becomes easier for people to make games. Certainly, with things like Roblox and, and sort of obviously mobile um, is a very open open thing. I, I guess the the interesting bit, and and you yeah, know maybe we don't need any more game developers per se. I don't know, but uh, um, but the interesting bit is I guess getting the professionalisation. Also, you know anyone can sort of put together something, but sort of learn, the, the the very difficult bit, I suppose, not necessarily the business side, but learning exactly sort of what level you have to operate at in order to have a product that can be seen as being sort of a professional business product and be taken seriously. And I guess those, that's particularly well, something that you, you guys are doing with, with Press Start because it's, you know, embedded in, 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 that, in that sort of industry. I think you pick up on a, on a sort of really, really good point there, which is that the, the majority of times when people begin to make games themselves, they make games that they want to play. And um, usually the problem is not many other people want to play them. <laughs> and, and so you end up with a very indie sort of outlook. And, and so sometimes it can be very culturally relevant. Sometimes it can be just a, a, a sort of purely personal project. And part of what we're trying to do is inject more of that um, commercial lens. And you, know, you can say hey, that's a kind of dirty word for a lot of purist game designers. But, but I mean it more in the sense of you want to make games that, people will play you want as many people to play your games as possible so you have to almost disassociate it as away from just being your own pet project to now thinking about you know what's what's relevant in the market what type of audiences do we want to attract how do they play how does that help inform your decisions how do you remove as much of that individual subjectivity which you do need at certain points obviously otherwise they'd just be robots making making these sorts of games but how do you how do you manage that with all of the other considerations that you need to take into account. And it's it's very clear that already on the program, you know, we've had the people on it for about three months or so now, that their mindsets have shifted very much from when they first came in wanting to develop their own game ideas to now realizing, well, it's not just me working by myself, I'm working within a team, but also then I've got to find a right fit for this game that I'm making because I can't just make it for me and my friends as well. So they're, they're learning very, very quickly, which is, um, and the learning by doing, which is ultimately one of our key aims with this program, is, is is to make sure that by the end of it, they can look back and say, I would have changed X, Y, and Z, you know, knowing what I know now, um, as well. So yeah, it's it's a it's a really important part of the learning process. You've done the sort of the first one sort of halfway through, and you said you say sort of yeah, it's a handful of people, like six six or seven people, I think. So um, obviously that that's great for those sort of people. Um, does this does this thing does this thing sort of stay that small? Can you does it scale up? Because I guess you know, um, you, you know the, the the overall broad plans for for kind of what you know. I mean, there's a wider vision. There's a 2030 vision for Saudi Arabia is, is over the entire sort of country. But but I, but I guess sort of big scale is something that they're quite keen on. So um, yeah, yeah. How how quickly does this does this sort of scale up? Is it can it be sort of used by other other companies? How will I mean, I guess it's quite difficult to say that maybe because you're in the very early stages of it. But. It's something that we thought about. Um, uh, absolutely. Like, like our ambition for us, Riyadh Studios, to grow to about 100 or so people by the end of next year. Um, so we're recruiting quite heavily. There are other studios that have been popping up in the region as well, certainly within Saudi Arabia. So they're, they're employing their own methods of, of, of sort of scaling up sort of population. Um, it's an interesting question because amongst the amongst the country at the minute you have a lot of government agencies who are enabling a lot of courses. Um, you know, you've got game founders, you've got the Ministry of Communication and IT, which is running lots of certification courses with Unity, with Unreal. So a lot of this stuff is happening at that scale, but that's mostly teaching people the basics, getting them up to speed. It's the sort of challenge they have is that once you have this hundreds, thousands of people that have gone through these programs, where, where are they going to go to work? And, and, and so um, what we decided was that for us, it made the most sense to start off on this basis. But then our goal with this program is to have two or three of these running potentially by next year at the same time, um, because there's no reason for us to just have it restricted to one. Um, it's also a really good way for people on the program to identify what type of role they would want to really be in, because they might, you know, they might think that they want to be a designer when they're coming in, but then realize actually they, they're they probably better suited towards art or sort of programming uh, or something else. So we are able to scale, but only up to a certain extent. 
Um, but there's enough initiative going on with the rest of the country that I feel a lot of the standards within gaming will increase quite a bit. And, you know, there are lots of internal targets as well for, uh, for, for the government in terms of what they've set, in terms of the, the number of uh, native game companies that they want to start. I think it's about 150 of those by the end of next year that they want to try and encourage. So there is there are things that are going on at scale across the entire you know, Saudi Arabian peninsula. Um, but for us, it was about um, quality over quantity and giving people the experience that we knew they could learn from. Uh, but at a scale that would make sense. And and we're just using a lot of our own game development philosophies to kind of apply that to the team as well. Yeah, I think, as you say, it's already reminded me then when you are talking about it. I, I used to sort of uh, be involved with some sort of student sort of, pro, um, sort of projects very similar to that. And, and it is interesting, I think, you know, because everyone plays games now, everyone sort of will go, oh, work in the games industry, that'd be brilliant sort of thing. And everyone, everyone wants to be a game designer because, of course, that's the like, that's like I mean, the, the, the centre forward in, in soccer, isn't it? So like the, the high profile thing. And then, and then you sort of get into this section and you realise actually what a game designer does and how it's like really hard. <laughs> and, and making a good game isn't just like, well, let's just add some more guns or a bigger boss or something. You know, it's actually the sort of subtleties of doing it. And then that's, that's I guess, the interesting, you know, I think that's what you're doing with, with, with Press Start is interesting because that, that sort of, that's the eye-opening sort of bit where people go from, you know, they want, you need them to have the enthusiasm. You need them to have like, love games. Wouldn't it be great to sort of be involved in making games, but then also to understand, yeah, this could be, Games, some games involve hundreds of people working for five years. I mean, this is, this is not the back of an envelope type type stuff to make a, a really high quality game now, and that's that's the interesting sort of dynamic that's going on. There. It, it sort of all comes down to a couple of questions or a couple of insights that we looked at when we first decided to really build build a studio. Um, I, I've been around the block enough to kind of see, uh, you know, what works and sort of what doesn't, and it really came down. To me to like two things and, and and the first one was that you know 95 percent of mobile games commercially fail so that was the first insight that was that was that was clear and secondly i don't think there's anybody in this industry that has more than a 10 percent success rate at best with the games they release and um we looked at those two insights and we said yeah experience helps but it's no guarantee of success um and so far be it from us to employ some chief product officer or you know sort of creative director and, and sort of have that as a bottleneck because usually, in my experience, those types of roles, people have made their reputation in one or two genres or, or, or kind of focused on, on sort of one or two titles. And beyond that, there's limited value you can really add if you've been working on Match 3 your whole life and now you've got a RPG game in your portfolio. It's a little bit difficult. So um, from our kind of perspective, the way that we've organized a lot of our development teams is in that kind of mode of, of, of sort of what we call tribes, which is kind of similar to, to what you were alluding to with some of the things that sort of Supercell are doing. Um, because we felt like that was the right way to go. And we give those teams complete freedom and autonomy. So they can kill whatever idea they're working on. They can start up a new idea um, if they want. There is nobody in the company uh, from a CEO level, from my level, who can come in and say, you're not going to make that game. You're going to make something else. Because as much as we might have had past success, there's no guarantee of anything um, successful in the future. So we applied that same mentality to this group, which was you get to choose what you want to make. You, you'll have to do your research and do all the other things as well. But ultimately, we want you to work in the same format as we would have anybody else work. Now, one of the interesting things that we did was that we sat down with the team when they first joined and we all watched the um, the uh, GoldenEye uh, documentary that was that was released, I think it was earlier, earlier this year. And it was to really give them um, more confidence because, you know, when you think back to that team at Rare that, that created that game. None of them had any experience in gaming. They hadn't shipped a game before. It was it, it was it was a game which um, they kind of were just thrown to um, rather than a game that anybody really wanted to work on. And, and you see what they managed to accomplish with that as well. So it's more about resetting their expectations of what to expect from themselves and not just think that they're going to release a sort of you know hyper casual game in sort of six months, but rather to say, hey, you can you can you can do what you want, and you've got no excuses as well because everything's available online you can find what you want you can learn skills as well so it's really down to you as individuals wanting to really push yourselves as well i think that's also where you find really good people um you know people who are willing to push the envelope and and, and really try and um maximize their own kind of potential as well yeah just uh, think in thinking like uh, when when people are giving that kind of freedom to try out things do their research uh, try maybe something a little bit unconventional. Uh, that's where where lots of great ideas come. That's why some 
indie games are really popular, you know, on and on mobile games, you know, the mm, recent trend we've had of the mini games popping up, it's it's because there have been really popular like small scale projects and in the in the hyper casual space where people are have tried different things and and that has also kind of bled into the advertising mobile advertising and and the sort of fake ads and and those have been coming coming to the bigger games then as well uh, as side modes or events or or um these mini mini game modes so so uh small small teams can really bring new inv innovations to to a bigger picture as well for like the like bigger company even if they make it in the in their smaller team i guess as we've seen with hyper casual you know these these sort of new um sort of subgenres, you know there was sort of very exciting to begin with and then they sort of become everyone works at the equilibrium so you sort of just end up where everyone's doing it and then it sort of saturates and then uh, but i think the industry is sort of quite interesting i guess maybe you know it sounds like i don't know how much you know you do this but it, it is interesting to have people sort of not be working on the same sort of game at the same scale all the time because that i think that's what burns people out but when you sort of move between sort of smaller things and you know and, and then sort of bigger things bigger projects i think that that sort of allows people to to learn different types of do, different ways of doing things because yeah I, I guess you know there have been people on the console side of things who basically work for 10 years for a game that gets sort of cancelled before it comes out and then that's like you know there's only so many games you get to make in, in your life i mean the nice thing about mobile is there is that sort of that that movement and you can sort of move in and out different projects and as you as you say this year i mean it's sort of you know it's not anyone's fault that mobile games fail it's just that's sort of sort of baked into the industry isn't it it's just, i mean some games that fail for bad decision making but most of them just fail because you know that, that's that's the way we are Ultimately, all all we're doing in the games industry is research and development. <laughs> until you until you find something that that sort of resonates on a scale that makes it worthwhile working on, um, all you're doing is, is sort of research and development. And, and it, it, it's akin to the pharmaceutical industry. You may have all the intentions to create a drug that sort of you know solves cancer, but the the likelihood of that is very small. But along the way, you have progress. You might find different things that you didn't expect. So um, it, it's sort of getting getting the press start team, getting all of our developers engaged in that mindset and also knowing that they have the psychological safety to be able to do that, that we're not sitting here expecting success from product one, two or three at all. You know, in fact, we, we expect 75% of what we're going to be working on for the next couple of years to not be commercially viable. But the question is, are you making progress in, in getting to what it is that that could possibly resonate during that time? And we don't want to be following trends. Um, if you're following trends, by definition, you're always behind. And if you've got a six-month runway to kind of get something out by that time, you know, the market's flooded with hybrid casual, whatever you want to call the sort of latest trend as well, uh, sort of sort of titles. So it's, it's interesting because people work different ways. Some people really like restraints. Other people like a lot of freedom. Um, but I think once you have a good group of people together who can respect each other, who, who can trust each other's capabilities and, 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 and sort of, you know, buying on that kind of thing that I mentioned at the beginning, which is that nobody has the right answer. So you can't come in with this attitude that this worked for me in the past, it will work in the future. It's no, you've got to be humble enough to know that, um, you know, set your ego aside and know that, that this is a, um, this is a journey of discovery. And, um, all you're doing is research and development. You will expect things to fail. That's what you should be doing. But out of it, you should be getting learnings and, and working towards something as well. And this is a great program we found for for really ingraining that in in the people that we're that we've got on it as well. Has there been any sort of feedback from from the sort of you know professional developers working there? Because I mean, maybe I'm sure they're already lovely people, but it's not. You don't always want sort of sort of newbies just sort of flowing in. I mean, that can be disruptive maybe for other teams. Or have, have they found it sort of quite sort of inspiring that you know get these new people in? It's not been something that's been disruptive because uh, our entire kind of recruitment philosophy um, is, is, is sort of centered around that idea that, that, that if you have an ego, if you have something that's, that's, you know, if you sort of come to us and say, look, I really want to make this game and um, I just need some people to do it. This is not the place, right? Um, we're, not, we're not kind of running a sort of one man shop or, or sort of one woman shop where you've got an idea and, and then we'll kind of just sort of instantly sort of finance it. For us, it's, it's, it's sort of coming to this with the right mindset. Um, and so everybody that we've got on the team, uh, on, the, on the development team, is fully appreciative of that. Because it, it starts from the sort of top down. Um, 
uh, honestly as well. So um, we haven't had any resistance towards it at all. It's been the other way around. It's it, it's been very interesting for other people to see how talented some of the people really are, despite some of the obstacles they may have had. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm but I'm fairly sure when you find people that have that passion, that have that potential, you want to work with them, you want to inspire them. I always say as well, like when you're first joining a company and you don't have any experience whatsoever, there's not much you can bring to the table other than that passion, right? Because you've got maybe people who've been working for 10, 15, 20 years who are maybe a little bit more, you know, jaded and, and sort of have some scars. And then you've got all of this youthful kind of um, enthusiasm coming in, which is which is injecting some, some level of hope or, or sort of whatever it is. It's really important that anybody coming in has that in order to drive things forward as well. And more importantly, to help challenge convention. Um, you know, one thing that we absolutely ban in the studio is, oh, I tried that before it didn't work. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's the easiest way to kind of kill something that could work in the future. Uh, so having a lot of people who aren't used to traditional development practices, who haven't been in that environment, they ask questions which most other people take for granted and, and, and sort of never ask. So in that way, it's, it's a very egalitarian way to work where um, everybody sitting around the table um, has, a, has the same level of input. Nobody's more important than than anybody else. Of course, you can't make every decision by committee. You do have to have you know leaders in place that will drive things forward. But that's what leadership's really there for for us. It's it's to help drive things forward rather than to tell people what to do. And um, you know, uh, we make that very clear. So everybody who's a part of the company is sort of brought in on that from the very from the very beginning. Very good. Well, thank you very much for uh, giving us a uh, insight into what you guys are doing at Sandsoft. Thank you, uh, Timu, as well, for, for, for your uh, insight. And thank you, uh, you guys, for uh, listening to and watching the podcast, however you are uh, consuming it. Um, please subscribe. Every episode, we are talking to people in the mobile game space who are building out this incredible industry and always dynamic, always new things changing, new games, new ways of working. So uh, please subscribe and uh, we will see you next time.